So today's key phrase that we're considering uh, in the current neoliberal environment is the ongoing privatization of public goods, especially with what we're witnessing with the ACO REACH program promoted by the Biden administration in its attempts to privatize Medicare. Um, so the Veterans Administration has undergone similar privatization efforts in the last decade or longer, uh, as I remember. Uh, we have here today with us a guest who has engaged in an ongoing battle against privatization of the VA, who will be introduced by uh, Hugh Foy. And after um, Suzanne's presentation, Andy Wellens, our board member, will relate his experiences with the VA system. And Jacob will present, I guess, during uh, Suzanne's presentation, she will take it from there. So I'd like to have Hugh Foy, who is going to introduce Suzanne, who knows her uh, fairly well. So take it away, Hugh. Okay, thanks, Dana. Well, Suzanne Gordon is a senior policy analyst at the Veterans Healthcare Policy Institute, as well as a journalist and a co-editor uh, of a Cornell University Press series on healthcare, work and policy issues. Her latest book, uh, which is not yet released yet, but will be here in the next month, is called Our Veterans, Winners, Losers, Friends and Enemies, on the new terrain of veterans affairs. And uh, it's gonna be published by Duke University Press and released on August 5th. So you can get your pre-release copies ordered through them or your favorite independent bookseller. Um, she's won a special recognition award from disabled American veterans for her writing on veterans health issues, much of which has appeared in the American Prospect, which she's a frequent contributing author. And her other prior work include a, a really great treatise, and I don't know, I think I just gave my last copy away, uh, was called Wounds of War, How the VA Delivers Health, Healing, and Hope to the Nation's Veterans, which is really an, a, a definitive, uh, dare say exhaustive work uh, describing the VA system and really how it works well for veterans. Um, so, during the QA, as we said, uh, Jacob, uh, Suzanne, you can, and Jacob can work that out. And then we're going to hear from Andy Wellens, uh, who's a, uh, both of whom are a veterans. So uh, without further ado, Suzanne, I'll turn it over to you. Great. So I'm going to, I'm going to let Jacob, because Jacob's in Chicago and it's getting later and later for him. I'm going to let him um, talk, talk briefly about his experience with the VA um, and Jacob is, is a Navy veteran, um, and he'll tell you a little bit about that. But before Jacob speaks, um, I want to do a little kind of quiz. And since we can all see each other, um, I want to ask you, um, when you think of, when you hear about the VA system, the Veterans Health Administration, um, and, and VA healthcare, do you think, what, what is your first thought that comes into your mind? Is it great care? Is it great care? What, what's your first thought? Yeah. Yes. I, I think it is great care. I have a, a lot of friends and relatives who were veterans mm -hmm. and uh, they always spoke highly of uh, the care and the, the doctors and, and people that they had to deal with uh, at the various uh, VAs brother. around the country. So well, just- And your brother. I, I, yeah, relatives and my brother. Yeah. Well, so, so, and I don't want to get into this too much because we can talk about it later, but I mean, maybe, maybe that everybody raise their hand. If it is a great care, great model, yeah. agree, or, or, or is it like bad wait times, you know? Because I ask this question because very often when I talk to even a group like this, um, you know, or a progressive group, a healthcare for all group, um, they, they will, you know, when I say, what's the first thing that comes into your mind when you hear VA healthcare, obviously sometimes they say veterans, but often they think bad wait times, terrible system, you know, et cetera. 
and I'm often I'm, I'm often surprised that even very liberal and progressive groups, people in them who wouldn't buy the purple Kool-Aid that's dished out about Medicare or Social Security or the government in general, often, you know, um, will will kind of buy the 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 bad trashing anti-VA narrative that's out there in the mainstream media and obviously obviously in the conservative media. So uh, uh, as one example, I was talking to a friend recently and he said, well, I was talking to, I met a journalist, a former journalist and I, what do you work on? And I said, I write about VA healthcare. And he said, oh, are you doing an expose? And I said, yeah, I'm exposing what a great system it is. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this guy was not a conservative. He, went, he wasn't a watcher of Fox News, you know. So I'm here to talk about why the VA is important and, and what it offers all of us. And Jacob is, is really um, thrilled. I met Jacob the other day on the phone through Andy. Thank you so much, Andy. And Jacob is, is, a, is a veteran who uses the VA. And he's going to talk a little bit about VA healthcare, and then I'm going to take over, and then Andy's going to finish up. So Jacob, the, the, would you tell folks who you are and, and then you know, help us understand a little bit better the VA from a veteran perspective. I'm Jacob Crawford. Uh, I'm a user of the VA. I've had, I guess I, I guess I consider my, the reason I agreed to speak today is I feel like the VA has had a hugely positive impact on my life. And um, I, I understand a lot of the criticisms and I've, I've worked inside the VA system as well. And, um, I don't know where to begin. Um, what I would say is that I've also, I also hear, I hear a lot of as to, so I was a, a veteran service officer. So I hear a lot, I, I've heard a lot of criticisms, but I've also, seen it from the VA's perspective. Um, so anyway, to, I think that gives an idea of why. Um, but anyway, so as, as we mentioned, I was in the Navy, I was an air crewman. Uh, I was a Farsi interpreter. So I spent a lot of time in the Middle East, Bahrain, over Afghanistan and Iraq. Jake's an Iraq war veteran, basically. Yeah. So um, I would say that uh, to focus on the VA, I got out of the military in 2005 and I didn't even know what the VA was uh, when I got out. Um, I, I knew that it existed, but I generally thought it was something only that catastrophically disabled veterans used. I was almost graduated from college four years after I'd gotten out before I think I needed to, I had like a, like a stomach bug or something. And I felt like I needed to go to someplace more serious. I had since spent, I had had insurance, private insurance, but I, I, uh, they were not, they didn't cover something. So I dropped it. And, um, I, I was, not desperate, but I was looking for options and I went to the VA and I realized that, wow, there's like this whole huge system um, that's available and, and very beneficial. Um, also around that time that I graduated, or well, actually, so I would go on to graduate, I would work a couple different jobs, but then um, I was also an anti-war activist back then. And I had a friend in Chicago that told me, you should apply for this job at a nonprofit called the VFW. Your friend Derek works there and you can be an advocate and you can help people get care in the VA. I barely knew what the VA was, but I, you know, I took the job and I learned about the, the history of the VA, the laws that govern it. And I had a, 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 in many ways, a good job that would help me advocate for veterans within that system. Um, I liked it. I did it for eight years and it could be very emotionally exhausting, um, but it was, 
I liked working for the Veterans of Foreign Wars Department of Illinois because our mission was very, very simple. And that's that we would try and get the veteran the maximum amount of benefits, no matter what. Bad discharge, full of crap, everything made up, you're homeless. It was all very, it was, um, that part was easy. But, you know, to be strategic, you know, it, that's where it got more difficult because a lot of people were probably having the worst time of their life trying to navigate the VA system and uh, a lot of times they didn't have, their, their, their case didn't meet the requirements of the law, but they were acting as best they could for their situation. Um, so generally speaking, I think that it was, it was, uh, all veterans benefit from that VA system being there. And I think that, um, the VA tries very hard and I think it does a very good job delivering care to veterans for my own life. Uh, the VA has been nothing but great. And um, one example is I, I had, I have gotten to a bike accident. It wasn't, I had knee, a knee injury from biking and I, my girlfriend at the time like insisted that I go to like top care because the reputation of the VA was that the VA was not very good. And I said, no, the VA is good. And anyway, I went to Northwestern, blew a whole bunch of money. And uh, I felt like for the first time, I felt like really insulted. And I felt like there was a, there was a way that the VA made me feel a lot more comfortable. Um, whenever I would go into the VA, it was just much more, I don't know, comforting normal. I don't know how to explain it. And, uh, where it's like in, at Northwestern, I literally felt like they were, they thought I was an idiot. Um, that was probably like all in my head, but, um, so then after I was done with Northwestern and I got nowhere, I went to the VA and I just had a totally different experience. Same results. I mean, I, I got an MRI for free, which was like $8,000. And like the, the physician was like, you know, it could go either way. We're not supposed to, but let's, let's do it just to make sure. And uh, it, it turned out to be just like a mystery knee pain that would pass after two weeks. But, but uh, the other interesting thing about that, that is that to meet, the VA has a lot of categories of, of entitlements. And at the time I had started that job. So I, I wasn't at the poverty rate. And so I was actually not, I was in something they call category eight. So you, you're not exactly entitled to much at all at the VA. So it was going to be like, you could use it, but you've got to pay for it. And I, I was like, oh crap, you know, it's an $8,000 bill. Not to mention all the other care I've gotten this year. And the, the VA just wiped it. They didn't, I didn't have to pay it. And I feel I, the reason I bring that up is because I pay attention to the news and it's like the VA is always getting criticized for, for not providing, but that you don't hear stories about where a lot is given away. That's where there's, it's by law anyway, not merited. Anyway, so I, I can honestly say, I feel like I get great care from the VA. There's one thing that they do is that they have a lot of reminders. And for a lot of people that are, it's just very helpful to get a lot of reminders by text and by calling and by letter. Um, I and do. You, Jay, could you talk about both? Because we're running out of time here, but could you talk course. about both? Yes. Rehab? Talk about the folk rehab. Yes, yeah, so that's another thing is, um, 
I would go on to get entitled as for service connected injuries. And uh, after eight years of working as a service officer, I, I felt like I couldn't do it anymore. And I, I applied for vocational rehabilitation to get a different job. Um, and the VA, I saw uh, like a career counselor at the VA and I, they said that, that I qualified and I wanted to study computer science. So I, I asked to study computer science. I went to DePaul University. I got a graduate degree, all paid for by the VA. And uh, now I'm a software engineer. I work from home and I feel like a success story. And um, I didn't just get paid. I didn't just didn't get school paid for it. They paid me to live while I went to school. And uh, I don't know. I, I'm just very pleased with the VA. I can't say enough good things. Jacob, thank you so much. You're um, very welcome. I, I can't thank you enough. And I hope you stay with us. Predominantly, most veterans are satisfied. It's, it's almost a silent majority. And what we've seen when there are the criticisms, it's usually because the VA gets underfunded or they end up not turning people away. I mean, they, they're very generous uh, as the case that was in either Arizona or New Mexico. And so, I mean, they're, they're taking on the people in society of America that get turned away from the broken system of the private sector. Right. And so between those two things, that's often um, and I know Jake got to see that when he was dealing with processing some of the disability claims. And that's predominantly what we've seen. And the two things when we've talked to other veterans who criticize the VA, we've almost never seen them substantiate the criticism. Like Jake's usually seen it where they're not comparing it to the private sector. Often if they have a wait time, it's because they they haven't compared they haven't like tried the private sector even to see like what would a wait time be for such and such. And uh you know, so, I mean, right, Jake, that's kind of what your experience was when you were doing that job, right? Um, I think there's a lot of truth to that, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, um, but, I mean, that's, that's the key thing. I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing how well it functions considering how many people it has to take on and the people that it tries to take on, not everybody who even met, meets all the criteria necessarily but they try to you know it's a lot of the homeless population of america too Correct. right jake a lot of your clients were, were part of the homeless population right uh that's true too andy thank you so much and jacob too um so i just want to start out by explaining a little bit because because you know jake and andy are talking about eligibility and homelessness and this and that and I just want to go over some of the stuff for those who aren't familiar with the VA. And so maybe we could go to slide two, David. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the VA is the largest healthcare system in the country. It, it, it's, let me just run through a couple of things. So it's the Department of Veterans Affairs. The VA stands for the Department of Veterans Affairs. It's important to get this right. Um, there's no such thing as the Veterans Administration. There's the Department of Veterans Affairs and the, and the Veterans Health Administration and the Veterans Benefits Administration. The VA is the lar second largest uh, federal agency in the government. I don't know, there's a debate. Is it, is it the second? Is it the third? I'm going to make it the second. It's uh, after the DOD. And um, there, the VA, the Department of Veterans Affairs has four... Um, sort of sub agencies, the, the veteran, and I didn't put this up here, sorry, the Veterans Health Administration, which it's the largest healthcare system in the United States. It has more than 300,000 employees. The VA also runs the Veteran Benefits Administration, which Jake is extremely familiar with, um, uh, which is, uh, you know, the largest benefit uh, administration in the United States, it administers the GI Bill, home loans. Uh, you know, voc rehab, all kinds of, 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 of things. I'm not going to go into all of it. Um, there's the Veteran Cemetery Administration, and then there's IT. The, but I'm going to focus in on the Veterans Health Administration. Veterans Health Administration um, has four missions. Um, and the first is to deliver high quality veteran centric care to veterans and to develop clinical models of care. 
I became involved in the VA because I write a lot about patient safety and teamwork and the VA is really an extraordinary um, uh, example of taking teamwork seriously, unlike a lot of other hospitals and health systems, which give lip service, we're all a team, blah, blah, blah. And um, if it, people want to go to my website, there's a video on teamwork in the VA called How to Huddle. Um, the VA's uh, second mission is teaching the VA and many of you physicians and nurse practitioners and PTs and so forth know about this, Dennis. The VA um, teaches 70% of all American physicians in training, you know, thousands of nurses, half of American psychologists, NPs, PAs, you name it. It's the hub of the American healthcare professional training system. The, the, the system would collapse without the VA. And it's one of the biggest research powerhouses in the nation after the NIH. Um, it, it has a very stable population from you know, discharge to grave. Um, at Nine million patients are enrolled. Um, six million are depend on the VA. And, you know, I always thank the VA for my first shingles vaccine for first implantable cardiac pacemaker, um, the nicotine patch. It now has the biggest genomic database in the world, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the fourth mission is something almost no one knows about. The fourth mission is to serve as a backup to the civilian sector system in a national emergency. We, saw, we see that in wildfires in California uh, and Hurricane Maria, the VA hospital in Puerto Rico was the only functioning hospital for everybody on the island. Um, uh, and during COVID, uh, the VA really came in to help uh, it, it hospital, every single VA hospital almost emptied its ICUs um, to, to prepare for civilian patients. They brought in civilian patients in um, New York and hotspots like New York, and they took over nursing homes in all over the country that were run by for-profit uh, companies. They sent staff all over the country. And, you know, because, because VA physicians are on salary and VA staff is on salary, you know, VA docs who weren't doing knee replacement operations, they could say do COVID, you know, do COVID testing or whatever. Um, I mean, it was extraordinary. And we're going to return to that. Um, I just want to mention one thing, and Jake talked about this. Tragically, because we as a nation do not want to pay the co full cost of war or military service, Congress will not pay for all veterans to be in eligible for VA benefits and um, healthcare. So I'm gonna just, Jake, forgive me for doing this really quickly because we can't go into everything, but basically your, your ability to access, even though in, the, in our all volunteer army, veteran recruits are promised free healthcare and education. In fact, the small print, which probably no 18 year old reads, um, you know, basically, your ability to access the promised benefits is dependent on your discharge status. Right now, for example, 600,000 people from 1980 have what's called bad paper discharges or on other than honorable discharges. They should be able to access VA care, but practically they can't, or it's very difficult because they were given this discharge it's not a punitive discharge in, in art. It's a, I, I don't know what, you know, it, it's a punishing discharge essentially. And there, they, many people who get these discharges, um, uh, a lot of African-Americans got them in the Vietnam War. Today, many people get them because they have a traumatic brain injury and didn't show up for formation twice or they got into a fight on the weekend or they're a woman who, or a man, who reported military sexual trauma and they're essentially drummed out of the military uh, with this bad discharge, bad paper discharge. Um, and then um, you in order to get into the VA, in 1996, they created these priority groups because when Kenneth Kaiser, who was the then Undersecretary for Health at the VA, 
came to, act to Sim, Alan Simpson, the senator, and said, I want VA to be eligible, open eligibility for everyone. Simpson said, sorry, I'm not, we're not gonna pay for all those vets. And they came up with priority groups. And essentially you cannot, you, you, you know, to get care at the VA, you have to either have a proven service connected disability, which is often extremely hard because of Jake and, and Andy can attest to, you know, they don't tell 18 year olds who go into the military, you need to go to the medic or the doctor every time you sprain your ankle, you know, or jump out of a helicopter and hurt your knee or whatever. Um, and then establish a paper trail so that when you're 40 and it comes back to haunt you, you can go to the VA and prove you have a service connected disability. They train people to suck it up um, in even physical injuries and particularly mental health injuries. So in order to get eligibility to the VA, you have to have a service connected disability or and or a, a low income. And so the VA essentially cherry picks the sickest, poorest, and often oldest patients, and still delivers great care to them at lower cost. These are very complex patients. The VA you know, ha has research that benefits us all, teaching, and it does what much of the rest of the American healthcare does poorly, primary and geriatric care, mental health care. The VA practically invented geriatric care. Um, it has, you know, high quality nursing home care. VA nursing homes are much better than five private for-profit nursing homes. It has coordinated integrated care. And what do I mean by that? I don't, you know, I don't mean that they just have a medical record because having a, the same shared medical record does not mean that you coordinate and integrate care. It makes it easier. It's, it's, it's a critical component of that. But for example, um, every VA primary care clinic uh, integrates mental health and primary care. So if a vet like Jay comes in to me as a primary care doc or a nurse practitioner and says, I'm feeling depressed, you know, or anxious or whatever, that primary care provider will walk the patient down to, this, to a psychologist or psychiatric nurse practitioner on the unit and they can begin, you know, discussing these mental these problems of mental or behavioral health or substance abuse right there in the clinic. And as you know, as doctors and nurse practitioners and PGs and so forth, you know, if you see a patient who's talking about a mental health problem and you tell them, you know, I'm going to give you a referral to a, 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 a you know, a, a, a mental health practitioner, often they won't make the appointment. If they make the appointment, they won't go, et cetera. And this is like an extraordinary model of care that is only possible in the same healthcare system. Um, another example of health of, of care integration, I uh, have a friend who's a psychologist, um, Milwaukee VA, she had a patient who was in for a gallbladder removal operation, a rack vet with severe PTSD, the guy got on the unit, the surgical unit and uh, pre-op had a complete freak out. The surgeon looked at the medical record, found out who the psychologist was, called her up, said, here, Joe is freaking out. She said, oh, Joe, right, of course he's freaking out. Here's what you need to do. And then she walked across the street to, to see Joe and the surgeon and Joe got his operation. That would be almost impossible in most other healthcare systems because you know the, the, the psychologist would not be in the same system, wouldn't have a shared record. Fee for service is not gonna drive from you know, suburban wherever into the VA in, in Milwaukee to go see the, the vet who's freaking out. Um, there are fewer healthcare disparities and deaths in the VA. This was true during COVID. There were many uh, African-Americans and people of color who had higher rates of COVID, but not, but fewer died. Could we have the next slide? VA has a, you know, there's study after study after study that shows that VA delivers care, diabetes management, mental health care, um, um, you know, chronic care, cancer care, whatever it is. Uh, and if people go to the Veterans Healthcare Policy Institute website, we have a 
and it's veteranspolicy.org. I'll put it in the chat during um, during um, during the Q and A. I'm afraid I can't multitask and talk and do it at the same time. But there's study after study that shows um, the this the the fact that you know having a coordinated national system of care makes a difference in outcomes. The most recent study was done by three economists at Stanford and it was uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. They did several papers and they looked at 401,000 ambulance rides of dual eligible veterans, that is veterans who had Medicare and VA. And this was actually the first study that was sort of apples as apples, you know, where they really compared veteran to veteran. And um, in the in there was a 46% reduction in mortality, 28 day mortality after an ER visit if the veteran was treated in a VA hospital. And the papers um, by Chan et al, uh, there's several of them. One in particular, and I'll, I'll try to put it in the chat, really explain why. And that's because, you know, the VA coordinates care. It's not just the electronic medical record, but there's actual care coordination. And again, on the Veterans Healthcare Policy website, uh, we have a blog post about the study and a blog post by a VA primary care doc who, who actually explains what that care coordination was. And by the way, you, you pay 21% more for the privilege of having a higher rate risk of dying if you go to the private sector than if you're treated at the VA. Could we have the next slide? So, you know, why is the VA better? Well, one of the reasons is they work on salaries, so there's no incentive to, to under-treat or over-treat. Um, although, you know, in medicine, even if you take away the fee-for-service system, sometimes the culture of let's do more is, and there was a recent article in JAM about this, is still there. There's a lifetime responsibility for patients, so there's more incentive to, to do preventative care and health maintenance of all sorts. There's a huge patient population that's consistent over time. And there's what I call a community of care for providers and patients where people share, it's a mission-driven system. They share a mission. They also have expertise in veterans. Um, they, they, they only care for veterans. So they kind of know the difference between Agent Orange related diabetes and regular type two diabetes or burn pit related asthma, respiratory problems and you know, asthma or you know, what military sexual trauma is, what, you know, how to treat combat related PTSD. Uh, there was a study that was done by the RAND Corporation called Ready to Serve. No, 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 sorry, it was Ready or Not. There was another one called Ready to Serve, where they looked at providers in New York State. There were, it's the fifth largest veteran population in the country. They asked, provide. they developed, um, it was primary care providers, mental health providers, PTs, nurse practitioners, and I can't remember what the other category was. They did a very rigorous survey and they developed um, a seven uh, a seven point you know um, scoring system for for how to show whether people had the capacity or competence to take care of veterans, and only two percent two percent of the providers that they that they surveyed met the rigorous criteria two percent, and that's because you know a lot of docs think or or healthcare professionals think. Well, you know, I can take, I can do my bit for veterans. I, I mean, a patient's a patient, a patient, what's the difference between a veteran and Suzanne or, or Hugh or David? Well, there's kind of a big difference a lot of times. They have very specific problems. They have more severe and complex problems. The average Medicare patient has over 65, has three to five presenting problems. The average Vietnam vet has nine to 12. My friend Kevin, who's an Iraq vet at age 30, was told that he had a body of a 60 year old and he had 16 different problems. Um, you know, the men, in, if you just look at men, um, they have um, way more muscular skeletal problems than, you know, the at the same age cohort 
Um, there's PTSD, it's more severe. They have a lot of dual diagnoses, which means PTSD and schizophrenia or whatever, bipolar. Um, it's a complex patient population. They are also very distrustful of the government. They're distrustful of authority. Um, they have moral, what's called moral injury. And a lot of them, and a, and a very small subset of VA patients, it's a small subset, but it's real, are a danger to themselves and others and can be quite, they are dubbed disruptive. There's a whole program in the VA for the disruptive patient. Um, in fact, it's pretty interesting. Uh, well, I won't go there. It's, it's, I'll maybe tell you later. But um, these are people with very specific healthcare problems. And you've got to know what you're dealing with. You also have to know their lingo, right? Your military cultural competency. I mean, if a vet says to you, you know, something about their DD-214 and their, and your, their MOS, and I just learned the lingo because I kind of had to, um, and you don't know what they're talking about, they can be not very trusting of you. And um, so it is a population health system. It's also a social determinant of health system is, as, um, as uh, Andy talked about, there's a lot of homeless vets, uh, chronic disease management. And, you know, there aren't a lot of healthcare systems that are dying to have a bunch of homeless veterans in their waiting rooms, right? Um, and the VA actually does outreach to these people. When I was writing Wounds of War, I spent weeks, weeks with a VA social worker going around San Francisco trying to find homeless vets who were homeless people who were veterans to get them into the system. I got, she taught me how to recognize in an alleyway where you might find a homeless person sleeping. I mean, I never saw anybody from UCSF or CPMC or Sutter going out there, you know, at the crack of dawn as we did, you know, looking for homeless people to bring into their system. So um, I'm not gonna go into this cause I sort of did this, but the next one. So we saw the VA benefits during the pandemic. I mean, because you have a system that has a global budget, uh, no fee for service, they acted immediately to cancel in-person appointments to, 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 not, elect, to you know, not have elective surgeries and so forth. And many VA folks were telling me that when they, when they did this, you know, the private sector hospital across the street was still bringing people in because they were losing revenue. I mean, one of the reasons the VA is so great on hospice and palliative care is that turning a patient over to hospice is a revenue neutral decision, right? They have huge and vast telehealth system and they were able to mobilize telehealth to reschedule appointments. And in the VA, um, you know, if you don't have a tablet or an iPhone uh, to, get, to do telehealth, they'll give it to you for free. Uh, they transformed ICUs um, to, <coughs> um, to COVID-19 wards. They have three telehealth ICUs that helped out, um, et cetera. And they replaced appoint, uh, appointments, virtual appointments, and really acted immediately to protect nursing home patients. So you didn't see the kind of horrible death rates in nursing homes in the VA uh, that you saw in the private sector. In fact, the VA often went in to take over state veterans homes like in North Carolina and other places that were run by private for-profit private sector nursing homes. Could we have the next slide? <clears throat> okay, so we have what I think is a great system. Is it a perfect system? No. Are there mistakes? Are there weights? Are there people who woke up on the wrong side of the bed? Are there people in healthcare who should have you know, done something else that doesn't have to do with human beings? Of course, uh, it's the largest healthcare system in the country, but it is, um, and I forgot to mention this, uh, it is also the most accountable healthcare system in the country. The reason why you read these headlines about some you know, critical access, small hospital in Roseburg, Oregon, that, you know, made it to the front page of the New York Times, or, you know, one death in one place, and it's on the front page of all the newspapers and on CNN, is because you have an accountable public health system. 
Congress, well, Congress, uh, which is another problem, but Congress is, it oversees it, not adequately in my view. Um, but you have the VA mm -hmm. Office of Inspector General, the, Gen the Government Accountability Office, the media, the veteran service organizations. This is, and everything that you see that happens in the VA and read about it happens elsewhere in the private sector. We just don't know about it, you know, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but I think it's a great system. It's a successful system. And that's why uh, the health healthcare industry hates it. And, and certainly the uh, right wing Koch brothers and, and, you know, the sort of Republican anti-government um, privateers, privatizers of everything, the same people who are trying to privatize Medicare, and I'll get to that in a minute, they want to kill the VA because there is an 80 to 100 billion dollar or more pot of gold that they cannot bear going to the public sector. They want that money. Pharmaceutical industry hates the VA because the VA negotiates drug prices. It's the only uh, one that is allowed to uh, drug prices and they hate it, they want to kill it. The hospital industry has allied with um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the right wing uh, privatizers to attack the VA and every little glitch that happens in the VA gets, you know, um, sensationalized and decontextualized and so forth. And you see that now and, and we'll go into it. Um, and um, you have, so basically what you have is a, a group of people who are now trying to privatize the VA. And they've done this through, uh, they started out with the Choice Act of 2014. And then this was followed by the Mission VA Mission Act of 2018. And then uh, uh, which dramatically outsourced patient care to the private sector. Um, and um, can I have the next slide? The Mission Act had within it something called the Air Commission. It set up something called the Air Commission, the Asset and Infrastructure Review Commission, which was a nine member commission that would be appointed by Democrat leadership, Republican leadership and the White House. Um, and um, the commission would decide which VAs to close or expand or improve. And um, the commission's member, this was a, a law, the VA Mission Act was designed by the Trump administration. And at that time, Trump had advisors in the White House and the VA from the Koch brothers, a guy named Garen, Darren Selnick, who uh, was uh, originally at the Koch brothers Concerned Veterans for America. And this commission would make a list of all the places to shut. And um, the Congress would have to, um, the, the commission members would look at it and they would have to uh, adjust it or make suggestions and then hand it off to the president who was able to adjust it. And, and the list would be submitted to Congress and for an up and down vote. So Congress wouldn't be able to say, sorry, Seattle VA has to stay in, you know, it, it was an up or down vote. Uh, could I have the next slide? The commission, the president chose the commission and the Democrats who are a big problem here because many of the Democrats voted for the Mission Act, an overwhelming number voted for the Mission Act. Pelosi didn't support it, 79 other Dems didn't support it, Sanders didn't support it, but all the Dems in the Senate except for Bernie voted for uh, the Mission Act um, and, with it, and with the Air Commission in it. Here's a, one of the big problems that we face is not just the Republicans who are deeply committed to dismantling the VA, but the Democrats. And it's the same problem that we face with Medicare direct contracting entities. Basically, the Democrats embrace the privatization agenda of the VA like they embrace the privatization. Many corporate Democrats embrace the privatization agenda of the VA like they embrace the privatization, ag privatization agenda of traditional Medicare. And Secretary McDonough, um, in the spirit of the privatization of traditional Medicare, came up, this is Biden's secretary, 
not Trump's, came up with recommendations for the Air Commission that would have completely closed um, um, 20 VA medical centers, 40 VA ERs and inpatient units, many community-based outpatient facilities and other facilities, and out dramatically outsourced care to the private sector. Um, this in spite of the fact that there is simply nobody out there, particularly in rural areas. Um, there are, you know, there's a, a, a massive and severe shortage of mental health and primary care professionals to take care of veterans. Uh, and I can share with you some of the healthcare professional shortage area maps that document this very vividly. And I have the next um, slide. They also um, uh, chose including Democrats, nominees to the commission that had serious conflicts of interest. Uh, the chairman of the commission, this was a Biden nomination, not a Republican nomination. The chairman of the proposed chairman of the commission was Patrick Murphy, former congressman from Pennsylvania who works for Cerner. He's on advi an advisory board for Cerner and which is responsible for this disastrous IT rollout in the VA. And he also um, is a consultant to Northwell Health, which is a huge uh, healthcare mm. company in New York, New York State, which would have benefited from VA privatization. Um, and nobody on that the Democrats or the Republicans nominated on the commission had for the commission had any experience in capital and asset and infrastructure issues. The VA has a real capital asset problem because Congress refuses to allocate funding, not only for VA staffing, but for regular maintenance of VA facilities. The VA needs 70 or $80 billion in, in just routine maintenance and Congress refuses all these congressmen and senators who love veterans like Jake and Andy, and thank you so much for your service. When it comes time to you know repairing hospitals and so forth, um, they they won't give the money. And I mean, the hospitals are not crumbling by any means because they couldn't get accredited and licensed, but they need help, and and Congress won't give it. Um, basically, what happened was because the Air Commission was. Uh, the Secretary McDonough's recommendations fo focus so much on closures of facilities. Even folks who voted for the Mission Act were inundated with veterans all over the country saying, don't you dare close my VA. And so basically, um, a group of senators, amazingly, we have Joe Manchin to thank for only one thing in the whole history of the world, but he basically <laughs> because he's from uh, West Virginia and they were going to close a lot of VAs in West Virginia. He and Mike Rounds, who actually is, vote, he's from South Dakota, voted against the Mission Act. Um, he and Mike Rounds and, and 12 other senators essentially said, we're not going to hold hearings on these commission nominees and air basically is going to die. Now, another couple of things that happened that are good for, for us on air. And this was a huge victory uh, uh, of, of folks like, like VHPI, some veteran service organizations, Common Defense, um, Veterans for Peace Save Our VA campaign, and AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees and other unions who really mobilized around this. We won a huge victory. We had another victory today um, and last week, because Jim McGovern, the congressman from Massachusetts, put in two amendments, one to the National Defense Authorization Act, killing the Air Commission, and the other to um, the VA military construction bill, which denies the Air Commission $5 million in funding. That $5 million was put into VA MILCON by Guess who? Debbie Wasserman Schultz from Florida, a Democrat. Um, and she and 20 Democrats voted against the McGovern Amendment, which fortunately passed. 40 Republicans voted uh, for it. 20 
Democrats voted against it. Um, can I have the next slide? Um, so right now we have gotten rid of the air threat, but the bigger threat is the cannibalization of the VA budget by outsourcing. VA now spends 33% of its clinical budget on outsourced care to private sector providers who we know deliver cost lower of, of lower cost, of higher cost and lower quality. In the last five years, the budget on private sector care in the VA has increased by 116% and on in-house care by 32%. VA clinicians and support staff now spend as much time acting as insurance company gatekeepers as providers of direct care to patients. And veterans like Jake and Andy, if they call up and there's an appointment for primary care and mental health, you know, in 21 days, the eligibility standards for private sector care set up by Trump's VA secretary um, dictate that Jake and Andy have to be offered an appointment in the private sector, even though they could have wait, they might have to wait six months or eight months or whatever for that private sector appointment because Congress refuses to impose on private sector providers the same wait time and quality standards they impose on the VA. Next slide. So um, in a recent hearing in the House Veterans Affairs Committee, um, it was very clear uh, that the Republicans want to get rid of any VA oversight for private sector care. They want to turn the VA into the only insurance company in America that says yes to everything and no to nothing. That, that doesn't protect veterans from unscrupulous providers. That doesn't prov protect veterans from the private equity providers that are invading uh, American health care. Uh, and the VA. Um, and what they want is they are afraid to close the Seattle VA, the Tacoma VA, the Beckley West Virginia VA. They, they're afraid to close it. They just don't want anybody to go to it. And they want to underfund it and understaff it so it'll crumble. Uh, next slide. And it's the same groups attacking the VA that are involved in pushing privatization of Medicare. Uh, United Healthcare's Optum is a third party administrator of the Veterans uh, Community Care Program. It's called, it's, this is hilarious. It's, it's corporate care has been re dubbed by the Republicans community care, you know? Um, and uh, they have, they pay billions to two, three third party administrators to who charge a fee for every appointment that a veteran gets in the private sector, as well as for assembling this network of providers. Um, United Healthcare Optum has, owns provider practices and they bring these uh, providers into the veteran community care program. So they get, a, they get to double dip. Um, their TriWest is another, um, the pharmaceutical industry, the Democrats who support, you know, what is it, ACO Reach now, um, and the Koch groups using VHA as a poster child of why government should have no involvement in healthcare. And what I, my, my message really to um, healthcare reform activists like yourselves is, um, I think it's really important for you all to A, support the VA, to be able to know enough about the VA to report and rebut anti-VA arguments that you, you will get. I mean, what you know, the Cokes and the right wing in the healthcare industry, they want to kill the VA because it's good, right? Just like they want to kill Medicare because it's good. Um, and they put millions into these efforts. If if the VA was a bad system, you wouldn't have to spend a dime on killing it because it would just like crumble on its own. Um, and um, I think it's really important for healthcare reform, single payer, national healthcare advocates to know as much about the VA as they know about Canada or France or Germany or whatever, because you have to rebut these, be able to have the facts to rebut these arguments. Um, and they are trying to convince veterans like Jake and Andy, 
not only is the VA bad for them, but Medicare for all or national health care would be a disaster for them. When in fact, um, it would be great for veterans and for their communities and for their families. Um, and um, it would also, um, I think, take away the push for privatization because if we have a national health system or Medicare for all, you know, and anybody can go anywhere, then you don't take from the VA if Jake wants to go to a private sector provider. Um, and I just hope that you all will join the fight about VA, against VA privatization, speak to your Congress people and senators about this, and also talk to veterans. I mean, this is something Andy and Jake can, can, can help us with. You know, we need to reach out to veterans because, you know, guys like Robert Wilkie, VA, uh, the VA Trump's former secretary, they're putting out op-eds saying, oh, Medicare for all would be a disaster for veterans. It would kill the VA. It's kind of hilarious. The same people who want to kill the VA and are working diligently to kill the VA want veterans not to support Medicare for all or national health care because that would kill the VA. I mean, it's it, these people have no shame. So, um, you know, that's my message. If there, if we could have on the next slide, um, I would encourage everybody, and I'll put this in the chat when people are, are talking, to go to um, the Veterans Healthcare Policy Institute uh, website and, and subscribe to our newsletter and noodle around. And if you're interested in learning more about the VA system, uh, you might check out my book, Wounds of War, or if you're interested in the, poli the fascinating politics of veterans affairs, uh, our new book, Our Veterans. And, and I can't thank you enough, you and David, for allowing me to speak. And I, I'm sorry if I've taken up too much time. Um, and I know maybe Andy wants to say some more things about, about the VA. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne. That was an excellent presentation. And um, I really think it speaks to the problems of having a profit-based system to deliver care to our public. Uh, the VA is, of course, nonprofit. Um, it's socialized medicine, but I think that's a good thing, actually. So now, Andy, um, now we'll hear from PNHP Washington board member and lead of the communications committee, Andy Wellens, will talk about his personal experience with the VA medical system. Yeah, thank you. I switched to Wi-Fi. Can everybody hear me now? Better connection? Yeah, much better. Perfect. Oh, all right. Apologies. Got to get a new computer. Um, so I don't know. Is Jake still here? He is. Oh, excellent. And Joe, well, I'll keep it concise. But I mean, I think that... Um, you know, one of the best examples, Suzanne, of, of this boomerang echo effect bashing the VA was when the Simpsons, they've actually bashed the VA twice on the so-called long wait times. But I mean, like I said, I've used the VA in northern Michigan, uh, I think in Wisconsin, in uh, West LA. Um, I actually have a veteran friend here as well who has just amazing things to say about West. He's in Florida right now. Um, but I mean, I would not, the thought of having to use the private sector, I mean, I, I just like Jake, I was not initially uh, aware of my benefits. And so, I mean, with our so-called multi-payer system, I've been screwed by it. I know it's some, some like I went to a dermatologist after the, after the Navy and I paid whatever I was supposed to pay. I thought everything was good to go. And then I, I changed addresses um, and my mom didn't afford me some follow-up bill because of course in our multi-payer system, there's always one more reason to bill you. And that turned into this big, crazy thing, and it ruined my credit score. And it's like with the VA, there's none of that. And it's allowed me to use so much preventative, participate in preventative care. And whenever I talk to people um, in America, especially in people in their 50s who are driving for Uber or whatever, and they're just waiting for their lucky day when they can actually pay to see a doctor. And that to me is so quintessential of what's going on in the United States. I mean, that, that's an example, of course. And that's, that's why... Um, that's why I do the healthcare activism that I do, because I know that it would be so transformative in the United States. And I mean, I feel like the VA is probably comparable to like the British system. And I know that would take a lot of political capital to get the British system. And I'm not trying to say that we do that. But um, but I always say to people, too, um, you know, it's kind of like getting when people 
do criticize the VA, I'm always like, well, we're talking about getting people like a Ford Focus and not a Mercedes. You know, everybody thinks like, oh, I need to have Kaiser or whatever. And it's just like the VA, as Jake will say, it's it's a lifeline. You know, I, I we know a veteran who actually wouldn't be alive. Uh, he had no other form means of uh, I won't say his name, but, um, you know, he's alive today because the VA offers him that. And um, uh, I do think, you know, just so it can get repeated, um, you know, when there is the issues with the VA, it's usually a because it's underfunded and because it's it is as generous as it is. Um, and. I got one friend who's been waiting uh, from Florida. He just wanted to like pop him. Joe, are you there? Yo, Joe, are you yes, there? Sir. Yep. Oh, hey, Joe, I want you to pop in. So Joe's, Joe was in the Navy for 20 years. He also served during the Iraq war and all that. Um, I, he, Joe's just going to pop in real quick from Florida. I just get from a different VA. Can you quickly uh, talk about your positive experience with the VA? Sure. And, and it's, it's interesting because I wasn't quite sure what we we're going to talk about. Um, so I popped on a little early and, and uh, listened to some of what Suzanne had to say. And it, it did strike a chord with me. Um, I've got to say, Andy, this is a long uh, way. This is a very different look from uh, beer margaritas and graham crackers in your teeth uh, about 20 years ago when we met. <laughs> Looks like you're, you're definitely making some changes in your life. So cool to you on that. All right. Thank um, you. So, um, since I got out of the Navy, uh, since I retired, uh, I've lived in uh, Texas, um, Maryland, um, Alabama, California, and now Florida. And um, just moving around for, for school and jobs and, and, and finally deciding, hey, this is where I want to uh, settle down. Um, uh, so I've experienced quite a few different um, uh conditions and, and different VAs. So it's not like I've just been to one place. Um, and the first thing I'll say is, is my most recent experience with the VA was, was out here in Florida and I was just checking in. And um, so basically I get one opportunity to see the VA and I, I feel like this is kind of to Suzanne's point, this is kind of uh, what we're looking forward to if we, we have more and more privatization. Now, the VA out here is, is 30 minutes away. Um, and basically I can't, I have one opportunity to go see them a year. Um, and that's just for annual checkups. Everything else is done okay. through either urgent care or, or, um, or, um, emergency rooms. Um, um, and that to me, that's, I mean, it's okay, fine. I'm getting treated, but there is definitely a concern about okay, some of the things that you're in out. Hey, do they have an experience? Do they have the experience of dealing with somebody that comes from a military background and the environments and conditions in which they're, they're placed and the way those conditions and, and experiences affect their health and their body, both, both um, mentally and physically. So I'm, I definitely am concerned going forward that, Hey, I can't just, a walk into a VA um, and uh, and get treated, or I can't set up an appointment for you know a month or whatever. Um, coming from a place uh, that I had excellent care, um, uh, which is out in um, out in Long Beach, California, uh, I was out there for about nine months and uh, had a couple of medical issues. I had a, a chronic cough that just wouldn't go away. Um, there were a couple of situations where I had pains in my chest. This was before I was even assigned a doctor and they're just like, hey, just come into the emergency room. So a couple of times I just came in at like two in the morning, um, really didn't have to wait very long. And and um, I got super care. At one point they checked me in um, and had me like hooked up to, you know, the EKG machine and um, had feeding me oxygen just to make sure that I was safe. Um, and this is, again, two, three in the morning. Um, I think there was, I was there for a total of five hours. Um, everybody was super great, uh, super attentive, um, left and gave me a full explanation of what was going on with me and, and how to follow up. And this was all before I was even assigned a doctor. But when I was finally assigned my, my doctor in LA um, or in, in Long Beach, um, like I don't know that I've met a more uh, attentive, uh, personable um, and, and obviously capable uh, doctor within the VA system. So that, to me, I felt like that was like just top notch and it was really amazing 
to just a just feel like, hey, this person is really listening to what's going on with me, is really concerned about all of my needs. Like she was just like, what else? What else? What else? What else? And I'm like, okay, uh, <laughs> I think I'm out of stuff, but I'll I'll make up some stuff. Like my shoes are not staying tied, or you know, just st- something because it just seemed like she really wanted to understand what my medical situation was and. Um, I don't, I mean, she was very professional, but it almost felt like, hey, I I have a confidant here as well as somebody that, that is looking out for my medical care. Um, And then, and and then regardless of other places that I went, I always felt like I did have uh, a safety net for my medical care. I always knew that, okay, maybe, maybe in, in one of the, one of the things that I am experiencing is that it does seem like if you try, if you set up an appointment, yeah, it does take a while to get an appointment, but I've never had a problem um, at any of the other VAs. It's a little different here in, in Florida. I, I did have uh, a situation. I had to go to air, urgent care um, and that, that it was fine. It just feels a little different when you're not dealing with somebody that, that you know is, is a VA affiliated um, and you're not you're not certain of what the process is with a VA in other places that I lived in, in Texas, Alabama, uh, Maryland, and California, I was able to just go in. If, if I had an urgent matter, I could just walk in and they would figure out how to get me seen. Um, now I might have Wait, to be sitting I have a question. For, uh, yeah. The urgent, the urgent care you went to, it was not a VA urgent care, just like a not random- here in Florida. No, it was uh-huh. just like, so the, the community I live in is pretty small. It's about a half an hour south of St. Augustine, a half an hour north of uh, Daytona Beach. Um, St. Augustine is where the VA facility is, but it's so, so like they're like, like we have to send you set you up a, an appointment to go to the lab just to get your blood drawn like two months out. Right. Um, but so, yeah, the urgent care was definitely I just go into a local place and it did it like it did. It was pretty smooth and they saw me pretty quick and I got the issue taken care of. But it it definitely was it took a little bit to figure out the process of going, making sure that, you know, I wasn't coming out of pocket for it. So it was, you know, there, there were growing pains. I did get my issue resolved and they were very protect, professional and and took good care of me. But it there was definitely a feeling of hmm, this is this is unusual. This is not what I'm used to. This is this doesn't have the same safety net feel, feeling. Um, I'm sure it's just a matter of getting used to it. But it, I mean, knowing that you're going to a VA facility, there definitely is something to be said. And everywhere I've gone, like I've gotten care that I need. So in in some instance, I did actually have to in Texas. I didn't feel like I was getting listened to. I did actually go to the uh, patient advocate. And I got my address, my issue address. So even when I was having a problem, I had a way of resolving that. If I go to a, a private care, I'm not sure I'm, that the same opportunity is going to come up. If I go to private care and I'm having trouble getting seen or getting heard on what my issues are, um, I, I don't like, what do I do? I just walk okay. out. And, <clears throat> well, thanks walk. so much, Joseph and Andy and Jake for your personal testimonies on I just want to second what he said, though, about the customer service and trust. I mean, and, okay. and I mean, I'm not to not to bash private, but I mean, like the the trust I felt that the VA has, I've I've never felt that way outside the VA. I would fight, and there's a I had a veteran who didn't make it tonight, but I mean, he's told me the same thing. He would never, he's done both, and he would never leave the VA, and that that's how I feel. Um, and I've even had it where, with this privatization thing, where they push stuff out, where I've had to use things. Um, a, it delays the care because there's one more level of bureaucracy. So this whole thing of privatization being good for veterans, it's never really, all it's done is make things harder for me. But also um, I was at, uh, when they privatized or when they gave me some, you know, outside care, I, you know, spare the details, but the person, the some receptionist there had actually like hung up on me, like rudely there, like, and I told the VA and the VA was like, we're going to make that right. We're going to find out who that was. And we want to, you know, like the VA, they bend over backwards to give you okay. uh, customer so, care. So let's open up the floor to questions of all our participants. Um, does anyone have any questions? You want to do the hand raise thing? 
David's got his hand raised. Go ahead, David. Yeah, <clears throat> Suzanne, uh, PNHP National and particularly in the Pacific Northwest here is focusing all our efforts in fighting the total privatization of Medicare with you know now the ACO reach and there's several events coming up in the next few weeks to that effect. So my question is, <clears throat> Do you see a way that the VA system could be integrated into uh, uh, improve Medicare for all a la Pramila Jayapal's bill where it could, you know, be keep its own system and but just have a uh, global budget, but keep the uh, providers and hopefully the expertise it's gained over all these years about uh, the integrative part? Well, I... In, in Jayapal's bill, um, the VA is not, you know, it's left alone. I mean, it, it, and so I think there's no problem with Jayapal's bill and the VA. I mean, what you do not want to say to veterans ever is that, um, you know, that the VA will disappear, which I, I don't advocate, you know. Um, but if you have a Medicare for all system or a national health system, whatever, um, you have the VA, you know, I don't know, I'm not an economist, I don't know how you're going to figure this out, but, you know, a, a vet like Jake or Andy or whatever would be able to go to the VA or to a, to a regular, to another doctor or, or, or PT or OT or whatever, um, and so the VA would remain as a choice, but, you know, um, veterans have to use, I mean, even, whether it's a national health system an improved Medicare for all or whatever, um, veterans will have, if veterans want a robust comprehensive VA, they have to use it. You know what I mean? You can't, you can't not use it or, or they're going to kill it. Right. Um, so, I, I guess, David, I don't really understand what, you, what you're getting at because I, my understanding is that in Jayapal's bill, the, the VA is basically remains there. You know, we have to figure out how much money to give it, but also if, if a veteran is, if we have a Medicare for all system and a veteran doesn't want to use the VA for this or that, the veteran could go to a private sector doctor under the Medicare for all system yeah. And um, and that money wouldn't come out of the VA the way it's coming out of now. But maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe we have to have more discussions with Jaya Paul's office about how this would yeah. work. Well, I think uh, she purposely left out the Indian Health Service and the VA, thinking that uh, you know once it got implemented that those systems could be integrated to without losing any of the. But what does that mean, integrated, in your view, David? What does that mean? Integrated? Part of an overall national system where everybody's covered from cradle to grave, but the expertise in the, you know, Indian Health Service and also the VA system, you know, it's got to be maintained, and right. there there can be a way to figure that out. Well, I mean, in my mind, and maybe maybe I'm, I should let other people talk, but. In my mind, the VA is like a pediatric hospital. You know what I mean? I mean, if you have Medicare for all, you're not going to eliminate oncology hospitals or orthopedic hospitals or pediatric hospitals. I mean, this is a, you know, a, a system of both inpatient and outpatient care that specializes in veterans' problems. Right. So I don't see, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not getting it, but I think that it would, I mean, I think you know, that there's an argument, I mean, that we, that one of the arguments for Medicare for all that should include not that, that we should maybe iron out. And, I, and again, I, I'm not, I think we need to have a discussion about this, is that um, I would argue that a big advantage, a big selling point of an improved Medicare for all or national health system to veterans would be that under Medicare for all or whatever you want to call it, um, every veteran would be eligible for VA as opposed to the restrictions that exist now. And that would be a very big, wouldn't you agree, Jake? I mean, 
you know, to, I mean, they have cockamamie restrictions now that nobody understands. I mean, you talk to people in the VA and I, you get, tw I mean, the hardest thing about writing Wounds for War was explaining these eligibility requirements because you get 20 different answers about what they are from 20 different people because they're so stupid. And, and also people with bad paper discharges should be able to get into the VA. And if you had Medicare for all, that would be true. Regarding how it fits into her bill, I don't know anything about her bill, but I, um, regarding the eligibility, I think that it, it's a bureaucracy. And so, you know, it, it does have a lot of rules, but what I always try and try and I, what I tried to tell the veterans when I was a ad, uh, case advocate, veteran service officer was like, I get that people get upset and I, I don't. I cannot say that pe some people don't have a really bad time, but it is a government institution that is guided by laws. And when something isn't going well, it's because they are following a law. They didn't wake up and decide to deny someone's care. The law, the budget, and, and it, that's always changing, by the way, uh, is what it is, and they execute that. And... I, I won't say that all those laws are fair. They're definitely not. But I think the, you know, the VA is, is doing the best it can. And I think it does a very good job given the, the very unfair laws and restrictive budget. Yeah, it's always you. in flux. That makes one, the other thing I would say is that um, if their biggest criticism is probably wait times, what, no, what, what I always think is when you're examining these criticisms in the press or whatever, um, you have to imagine what, what can the VA say in response that's not in poor taste? Because it's very faux pas to say, yeah, but the veterans are not meeting their end of the bargain. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's very, that would be, that would get them, you know, that would look really bad, but they have a 60% no-show rate. Yeah. And they are dealing with a different demographic than like Northwestern Hospital, for example, here in Chicago. It's just a different scene. Okay, well, <clears throat> so let, let's let, let's have a few more questions. So, Margaret Walsh, you're up for the next question. Hey guys, uh, Margaret, um, you know, uh, when you asked what what do I think about about the VA, the first thing that came to mind is uh, the locations, and I remembered that on the north end of Beacon Hill, remember there was a federal hospital there where Amazon had its headquarters, that beautiful building on the north end of Beacon Hill. And, yes. you know, of course, the VA is on the south end of Beacon Hill. Yeah, so I heard rumor that there were nine federal hospitals around the country. So if for some reason you needed to go to a hospital that they would cart you halfway across the country to go to a hospital, that was the first thing I thought of. But I just wanted to add that the Yakima Herald, uh, said had an article it was seven years of painstaking dedication but the new va in union gap is opening this year it's the double the size of the one that was on fruitvale in yakima so um bravo and it's a, a full uh, service uh, facility so thank you okay ronnie um my question is about uh, the political uh, nonpartisan or Bipartisan. combination Republican and Democratic uh, coalition that's really trying to fight the results of the Air Commission. Uh, and it it's one of the battles that we're facing with uh, <clears throat> universal health care. When we talk about Medicare for all, uh, we're finding that there's enough opposition like mansions and, 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 and other uh, Democrats in the country who can just stop everything from happening where uh, I guess I, being an optimist, thought that a combination of Democratic and Republican uh, people or candidates or lawmakers would be able to really solve the situation, but it sounds like they're making it worse by 
you know, not closing a old building uh, uh, because it's, you know, it increases access and at the same time not funding the right type of buildings. What What is the lesson that we can take from this current fight that the VA is having uh, to have an impact on our fight for Medicare for all for non-veterans? I think that, um, I think that, you know, it's a mobilization issue. And um, I think that what we learned from the fight for, against air, which we won, it looks like, is, you know, you've got, I mean, we went to city councils that were never involved in this before. We got activists that were never involved in this before. The unions got really involved in it and they hadn't been involved in it enough before. Um, it's an organizing effort. And, you know, it, it was easier in a way than Medicare for all because they were gonna take something away, right? You know what I mean? And um, I mean, per, I mean, we, you know, I personally believe that the communications around Medicare for all has not been very good, I'm sorry to say. And I think, you know, there needs to be much clearer explanations, videos, animations, maybe I'm missing something. But somebody, you know, there has to be very clear uh, messages about you know, I've always wanted to see an animation. I believe in animations. I think they can be great. Um, where, you know, somebody says, no, actually, you're not going to be paying premiums and out-of-pocket payments and blah, 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 and, you know, taxes for Medicare for all. It's somebody, you know, somebody needs to do some, we have to get cleverer about this. Um, and I don't think we're clever enough, you know. Um, I think we need to go to the, I mean, I, all right, I'm steeped in veteran land, you know, I think we need to go to the veteran community and recruit veterans because they have the, because this is actually, this is a very good time, Ronnie, to go to veterans because they've been fighting this privatization and they've been seeing what they, what people want to take away from them. And you actually have some, you know, conservative people who've been mobilized around this. You have city councils. I think we need to go to these people and say, you know, you want to end VA privatization. You want people to stop trying to kill your hospital, your clinic, your this, your that. You should be for Medicare for all or whatever, you know, national <laughs> health system or whatever, because the only way to stop these people is to get them out of healthcare because they're going to keep coming after you and your budget and your facility and your care and your family. So I think this is actually a good time, you know, to approach veterans. And we have, you know, some folks here. Um, I mean, but, you know, what can I tell you about America? I mean, it's such an uphill battle. Um, I, I'm staggered that we won this one and I want people to go on the offensive in the anti-VA privatization stuff. But, you know, I do believe that more conversations like this that we're having tonight need to happen because we can bring some folks in. I mean, we got Jake on the phone. Jake didn't want to come, you know. I mean, he heard, you know, my my feeling is this is all worth it because we got two vets on the phone who don't know much about this and who were listening to it. Um, I don't know, I mean, I think it's a it's a very difficult battle. Okay, thank you, uh, Hugh. Having first worked in the VA and stepped in to one in 1977, I've worked at the VA intermittently for a long time, and I've seen it change considerably. Back before all 14 eligibility requirements were cumulatively established, the VA was a cattle call. And at the original inception was that anybody who served in any capacity for any length of time could use the VA services. But the, it's a matter of money. Federal government decided they couldn't pay for it. So they started to ratchet back uh, with all of these different eligibility requirements, such that 
Uh, and the good thing is the VA has had a lot of incredible innovation, the electronic medical record, barcoding, uh, computers on wheels to serve medications, uh, the best QA. But the fact is, it, it, it's been a bit of a Potemkin village. It's a bit of a facade because of the lack of access. And one of the main points of the healthcare reform movement is access. Without access, you've got nothing. People complain about delay. In the private sector, with backdoor connections, I cannot see a doctor within three weeks. It ain't gonna happen. I can go to the ER and the bill will be $6,000 for an acute problem, but we train less healthcare providers in the United States of America than any other developed country. Yeah. We, we suck eight to 10,000 physicians out of the poorest countries of the world every year to fuel what's left of our public sector, uh, and, which includes the VA uh, from India, Pakistan, and Africa and other places. So it's a matter of money and it's a matter of societal priorities. Our country does not think healthcare is a human right, whether you're a veteran and you served in these interminable 25 years of continuous war we've just been through, or you're a retired professional, or you're some homeless guy in a tent. Our society doesn't value healthcare and our government is not willing to put up the money and develop the infrastructure like the VA, which is an excellent one, which is like the National Health Service. Unlike the UK, the United States of America doesn't feel that healthcare is a societal value. Well, I mean, you know, that's true. Everything you say is true, but we have to change that. And you know, we're all, you all are trying and we're trying. And I mean, I wish we could be a little cleverer about it. And, you know, um, I, I don't want to end on that note because, you know, I, 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 I don't know what to say to that. I think you're right. I think. The privatization of everything. It's, uh, to me, the problem is as big and really dovetails well with housing. That we don't think housing and a roof over a head is a human right. And real estate inflation is out of control, just like the medical uh, industrial complex is out of control because of the profit motive. Until we have some kind of major shift in societal values, I think what we're doing is important and to ed try to educate the public, but... Um, it really needs to be a, a huge uh, societal paradigm shift. No, I couldn't agree more. And I think we're all trying to do that. I mean, that's my mission. And obviously it's all of yours because here we are spending, you know, a night together when we could be drinking or watching TV or, I don't know, going out and getting COVID. I think Steinbeck um, had a concise, uh, it was Steinbeck who said the problem, the reason socialism never caught on is because America's full of a bunch of temporarily embarrassed millionaires and I, and there's a lot of that yeah you know i mean that that is that ideology i mean granted in america socialism is popular now with millennials but when i talk to veteran or you know when i talk to like civilians most people are either grat like these people i know in their 50s who are driving for uber just waiting to save up a couple bucks. Like they're, they're not going to do preventative care because they're like, oh no, that could be expensive. And most people are um, either waiting to win the lottery. Like I just got to put my nose to the grindstone because that's the current American message of we live in a meritocracy. If your life's hard, if you don't have proper access to a doctor at Kaiser, you must've made a bad life choice. You know, you should have learned to code or whatever. Um, you know, and so a lot of people hold out for that. Not many people question that narrative instead of like, well, what if I just want to be a forest ranger or I want to be a, um, and a lot of people feel too busy to get into the details. So, I mean, um, you got to promulgate this message, okay, but so, it's, <clears throat> anyway. Sorry to cut you off, Andy. We no, no worries. A little, not much more time, but uh, Mindy, you have a question? 
I just have a quick question. Um, is the VA system separate from um, like the Air Force medical um, system? Because I was, I did a locum tenens. Yeah, I did, yeah, I did a locum tenens uh, uh, several times at the um, Air Force base in uh, Tucson. And there were, there were all these kind of criteria as to whether you could be eligible to be in that clinic. And then I was, there was some experience where some people were getting, um, they were trying to be um, thrown out <laughs> because of strict medical um, criteria such as um, their waist circumference was too big or, um, and then they would lose their medical benefits too. Yes, yeah, so um, Mindy, and the, what I think what you're asking about is the military health system. So the military health system is separate from the Veterans Administ Health Administration. The military health system, which is run by the military and their hospitals and clinics on bases, and then there's you know Walter Reed, the Army, the Navy has hospitals, the Air Force. That's completely different. They're also trying to privatize that. Um, but, but the VA is completely separate from the military, the MHS, the military health system. It is not the same. And also the medicine it practices is very different. The VA deals with chronic conditions management largely. We, we have, for example, the military health system doesn't do rehab and active duty service members who need rehab, like if they got into a motor vehicle accident or something, they go to the VA for rehab and the DOD has an MOU with the VA because the military health system, it's kind of like football medicine. It's, you know, like get them in, get them out, get them deployed. And then if you're non-deployable, you know, then they can chapter, what's called chapter you out, um, sometimes with the medical discharge or sometimes they get them out with these other than honorable discharges. So they're not the same systems. And I just really, I know we have to finish. I, I really want to conclude on a positive note. You know, it's pretty depressing out there. I mean, the world is burning up, Roe v. Wade, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that there's hope. And I think we have to be not only, we can be privately purveyors of despair, but we really need to be purveyors of hope. I, I mean, we're knocking our heads against the wall, yes, but I think that there's a lot to be hopeful for. I mean, look at whoever imagined that Amazon would have even one union, you know? I mean, um, whoever thought, I mean, I think a lot of people are mobilizing because of Roe v. Wade. And I think that we need to be, you know, hopeful um, as much as we, I mean, you know, it's like Gramsci said, right? You know, what is it? Pessimism, the intellect and optimism, of the will. And our job is, you know, what, I probably shouldn't say this, but one of the things that I've always felt about the PNHP, and I haven't seen it in years, but the PNHP standard slideshow, and maybe it's changed, but um, you know, the, when I used to watch Dave and Steffi or our old friends do this slideshow and it would be like 200 slides or 100 slides about how horrible the American healthcare system is, horrible, 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 overwhelming odds against change and then five slides about Canada. We have to reverse that. We're selling a new car, you know, and when you go to buy a new car, you know, a, a new car salesman doesn't spend I mean, maybe you're going to hate me for this, but, you know, they don't spend 20 minutes or three hours telling you how horrible your old car is. They start telling you what, how wonderful this car is that you're going to buy that you could walk off the lot with. We have to engage the part of people's brains, you know, because I used to listen to that slide show and by the time they got to Canada, I was ready to slit my throat, you know, and and I think we have to, you know, there's a reason why people start presentations with a joke because you're triggering a part of the brain that is more receptive. And, you know, I always tell folks that are organizers, watch the movie, No. Has anybody here ever watched No? Gael Garcia Bernal. 
Watch no. No is no tells you everything. We need no. 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 It's N-O? It, yes, and it's a brilliant movie about how they won. The left won the victory in the in the in the Chilean referendum in 1998 against Pinochet. And you should watch no, and then we should have a strategic discussion. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Suzanne. No being yes. No, no being much no to see how you can get to yes. I I can't thank you enough, you and David and Andy and here. You know, it was thank great. You. Um, That's really a lot of good information, especially the part about the VA being back up for a national emergency. That's new information. For me. Nobody knows about that. You know, the fourth. No, I didn't mean that. No, right. Yeah. A big okay, deal. thank you so much. And I know everybody's tired, and you know, I wish we could all have go out for a glass of wine, but you know, this is COVID. Yeah. And maybe we should next meeting we could, you know, everybody required to bring a bottle of wine, and at nine o'clock we just all drink together. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't mind. <clears throat> okay. Thanks so uh, much, Suzanne. Thanks so much thank for attending you. this for attending this meeting and are we finished david well i just wanted to thank the the suzanne and the veterans that spoke and that was Great. really really and good. Andy for the veterans andy's responsible for that yeah i <laughs> well, corralled like, them yeah well Thanks, it was Andy. really a lot of Thanks good lot, insight and really good insight and my brother-in-law had you know he was a, a vietnam vet with severe PTSD and subsequent diabetes. And he, he just got really excellent care at the VA in Buffalo. It's a lifeline. I know of, I know veterans who are still alive because of the VA and they have nothing. And I mean, it's, it's why I, I am part of PNHP because I know that if I could give America what I get at the VA and then America would, it would just be transformative. Um, yeah. I, that's why it's why I know so-called socialized medicine works because yeah. I love the VA so much, you yeah. know. Um, simply oh, put, and that, uh, we had our, our other friend who came to visit. He was like passing through, and he had a pulmonary embolism and ended up at the VA in Seattle. It got really spectacular care. And is doing fine now, you know. I mean, it's- oh, and, and also, you know, I have a friend who's who, he, who's um, she's a professor at Villanova, and we were talking. I went to talk about wounds of war there, and her brother was a Vietnam vet who had severe PTSD and would have ended up homeless at one for the VA. And what she said to me was, the VA not only saved his life but saved my life because she um. would have had to take care of this, you know, messed up, I mean, very um, severely mentally ill brother. And it, it, I mean, anybody who has had somebody severely mentally ill in their family, you know, I mean, the VA doesn't just help the vet. Yeah, you know, everybody you know, in, nobody I, out. I'm gonna tell you a very funny story um, in closing, because this is a fun story. Um, and this shows you what I talk, what I mean by the community of care in, in the VA. So I was in the San Francisco VA doing my book, Wounds of War, I don't know, five years ago or whatever. And I'm sitting in the canteen in the cafeteria. And the one criticism, and I bet Andy agrees with me on this, the one criticism that I have of the VA is it has like the worst food in the entire <laughs> world. I agree. I agree. Horrible. And Not every- West LA. Not West Los Angeles. Oh, good. Is that right? Uh, it's different. Well, the pizza. Well, actually, I love that pizza, but it, you're not going to lose weight eating that pizza. I'm sitting in the in the canteen at Fort Miley in San Francisco, and I'm waiting to to do an interview. And it's lunchtime. I'm sitting at this table, and you know it's crowded. So this guy comes, sits down next to me, and um, and. Um, and, and I don't know, we get to talking, he says, what are you doing here? You know, and I said, oh, I'm writing a book about v- the vet, you know, the VA healthcare system. And he goes, oh my God, you have to talk to the, this guy. 
I can't tell you, I mean, he, my bipolar disorder, and he starts telling me like, this is like a complete stranger about his mental health problems. And I have to talk to the social worker. And then there's a guy who's sitting in the next table and he, he says, oh my God, I have to talk to you. You have to come talk to me. This is like, okay. And he says, oh my God, you know, I was beating my wife. It was terrible. I mean, the VA saved my marriage. And he's like, I mean, I'm sitting there like I, I've sat in a lot of a hospital cafeterias. And let me tell you, this does not happen very often. And then I'm and then there, I'm talking to him. And then this guy goes by and leaves me a napkin with his phone number and said, I couldn't help overhearing. I have to talk to you. And it was like another day. <laughs> and I'm like, Man, that, that they're they're doing something right here, you know. <laughs> anyway. You're right though that. Even in West LA, they had surfing lessons to deal with PTSD. Right. The West LA was paying for people to surf, and it was I didn't even have it, but they were like, "Hey, we have an extra spot. You want to help out?" Uh, they even had Tai Chi. Right. So uh, for people with PTSD, you know, or, hey, or even they're like, "Hey, are you a veteran that has, you know, you just want to learn to relax more?" They had mindfulness classes, but I mean, they were teaching veterans to surf to do with, and it, and I actually watched it help veterans save yeah. them from their PTSD down in LA. So, I mean, they're very innovative. Um, they truly are there to like make you better. And I, I mean, I, I want the VA to stay the way it is. I don't want to see, I will fight for it until I'm gone. You know, like I'll fight for it forever. Cause if you love it, you fight for it, you know? Okay. Thank you um, everybody. So, Hey, thanks a lot for all your participation in this wonderful um, conference that we had on not-for-profit healthcare. <laughs> and uh, on the closing note, I would like to say that uh, we see what happens to our veterans when they have to do what they're trained to do, and that um, war is bad. So any attempts that we can avoid going to war would be uh, in in line. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you thank so you. much. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks, David. Great. Great nice to see everyone. Thank you so much. Take care. Yeah. Thank you, Suzanne. Um.